So uh, thank you all for staying. No, it's still a little bit too high. Thank you all for staying to the end of the session. Um, so let's see. Uh, given the, what the session is, it feels like it would have made more sense to talk about nucleosome positioning. Uh, but on the other hand, I sort of have the feeling that um, when I talk with these guys, it's, it's nice to break things up and do something a little bit different so people, you know, keeps people awake. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, histone dynamics. Um, uh, right, so here we go. So my lab is generally interested in the process of epigenetic inheritance. Since there's so many different versions of this word floating around, I'll define my term. Uh, Epigenetic inheritance, I use it in the holiday sense. Something is epigenetically heritable if you have two different phenotypes that are mitotically maintained without any change in underlying DNA sequence. Okay? Uh, the cocktail party version of this is that every cell in your body has the same genome, more or less. Let's ignore immune cells. When a liver cell divides, um, it's still a problem. Jesus. Just leave it on the table, maybe. Um, when a liver cell divides, uh, it never makes intestinal cells, it always makes two liver cells, despite the fact that the liver cell and the intestinal cells share the same book of instructions, right? So state liverness is an epigenetic state. Now, uh, it is widely believed, although uh, way less widely believed, uh, that chromin carry epigenetic information, so if we get into it, um, seeing level of impact rather than any sort of these interesting question with uh, chromatin inheritance but the consistent question is quite interesting because DNA application as photocopying is asking how do you photocopy a piece of origami this, of course, I'm only presenting this, you've seen this several times now, so that you can get this for how we cartoon things, just so that you're not jarred by the chain uh, a little bit down the road. So, um, in terms of things, there are at least tools out there how to do this. Uh, models, uh, basically, for and the histones have to come off. Uh, we don't know at this point how long, long they switch back down. Uh, this is, of course, important to know because the two strands of DNA bases start diffusing relative to each other. One, but we do know that in bulk, old histones go large genomes. Uh, so, what happens? Daughter genome, of course, the other half of the synthesized histone. And so in one model, what happens is the old where they used to be, and somehow they talk to newly synthesized. That's the equivalent of base pair. Okay? So in this model, it's sort of mapped right out because the further they spread out, the lower your fidelity of the answer. Another model is basically based on the People observe highly acetylated chromatin, rapidly acetylated late. If early in S phase stones in phase poorly acetylated histones, chromatin is late. So basically, the time slicing is, is your mechanism. Uh, this probably doesn't work for yeast, but I'm just for watching care of this. Um, so, so our while and try to measure uh, aspects of how nucleation forms. So before you can measure how nucleosomes move, the replicant nucleosomes uh, move or are replaced, et cetera, replicate. Um, and so to do this, we basically what's a pulse chase type of system. Uh, the strain came from Korber's lab. Uh, and what we have is two different epitope-tagged histones. So there's a MIC-tagged H3 under the native promoter. There's a flag-tagged H3 under a gal-driven promoter, an inducible promoter. Uh, we arrest cells in G1 using alpha factor. And so at time equals zero in G1, uh, so they're not going through replication, all of our histones have a MIC-tag on them. 
Then we induce the gal tag, uh, and at varying times after gal induct of flag H3 induction, uh, we measure the flag to mic ratio across the array. Okay, and so you'll find some places that pick up a flag tag early in the time course. You'll find some places that don't pick up flag at all. And what you infer about this is that these histones were being rapidly replaced with the free pool of histones. We call these hot. And these nucleosomes are not being replaced at all. We call these cold. Same molecules there at the end of the time course as was there at the beginning. And so our big expectation when we started this was that what we'd find is that uh, coding regions, genes, would basically turn over nucleosomes at a that scaled with how often polymerase we're going through. Because of course, polymerase is big and bulky. You're not going to co-occupy histones with the polymerase. Uh, and it's usually the case when we make what I call big predictions, we're completely wrong. Uh, and so what you find, this is a real stretch of the genome. What you find is that the nucleosomes overcoding regions are in fact the most stably bound nucleosomes in the genome. Other nucleosomes that are being exchanged rapidly. This genome of looking at this, oh, you're not going to see this at all. Uh, each of these column nucleosomes are rapidly exchanged to cold. People hear me. Uh, what you see is that hot nucleus is the nucleus and in the middle of the nucleus. Okay, so why? Interesting aspect of the modification paths of histones that have been lacking dynamic of the cell. Whether these are sort of pop in every 15 minutes or so, and they carry into those nucleosomes the average modification pattern of the free pool. Okay? Um, so this is all published. I'm not going to talk too much about it. I'm just going to go through one little vignette that's um, uh, for word count reasons didn't make it into the paper, and I think it's a useful way to, to show how we can go from uh, data mining in this uh, here to sort of mechanistic insight. And this is to sort of focus on uh, turnover over coding regions. So this is the distribution of turnover rates. These are hot, these are cold. Uh, this is the bulk distribution across the genome. And as I mentioned, you see that over uh, open reading frames, your distribution is shifted left. So open reading frames are cold. However, there is a little right tail here. So there are some coding regions that are, have nucleosomes popping on and off. Um, and so where might this occur? What you find, uh, this is not so easy to see. Actually, we'll just skip the slide. Um, if you compare turnover rates over the middle of coding regions, so we're ignoring the ends of genes and we're ignoring intergenic regions, and you compare to the enrichment of RNA polymerase, so the transcription rate of the gene, what you find, as I mentioned, is that the vast majority of genes have very low turnover rates, so they're very stably bound by histones. But then you do have this upper right tail where you find that very highly transcribed genes do replace nucleosomes at, uh, at a relatively high rate. Now, there's a fair bit of spread in this data, and so you can say, is this noise in the measurement or is there something biological here? Uh, interestingly, if you sort of pick out the spots above the diagonal, versus the spots below the diagonal, if you just look at guys up here, they turn out all to be genes that we've induced through our experimental manipulations. In other words, we use GAL to drive the flag H3, so the GAL genes are uh, turning over quickly. We use alpha factor to arrest the cells, and you find sex genes are turning over quickly. So the thought is, okay, well, what if the first round of transcription is much sloppier than the sequence of transcription? We don't think that's the case, because these cells have for three hours before we induce the flag. Um, the other thing you imagine, well, it turns out the other thing that unites these guys is that genes in general are broken into two classes, like genes in almost all organisms. The first component of gene expression is growth versus stress. And so these guys are all uh, Tata box containing, saga dominated, 
uh, so again, what you find is that for a polymeral stuff Tata box containing stress genes, uh, a higher turnover over the coding region than TF2D dominated housekeeping proteins. Okay, so why might this be? Um, our hypothesis for why this occurs comes from uh, in vitro biochemistry from the Studitsky lab. Uh, and what he showed uh, a while ago is that if one RNA polymerase runs into a nucleosome in vitro, you can actually leave the histones behind. So RNA polymerase can get through a nucleosome without evicting the, the histones, but it pops off an H2A, H2B dimer. So you end up with a hexamer. Now if you run a second polymerase into that hexamer, it will evict all of the histones. Now, the difference between stress and growth genes, among many other things, is that stress genes show large pull to burst size, okay? So in other words, and the reason for this is that the Tata box has a slow off rate for TBP or vice versa. So at a stress gene to get 10 polymerases over a gene, fire, 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 pause, fire, fire, fire. Polymerases come in clumps. At a growth gene to do the same thing, fire, fire, fire. So the polymerases come through much more evenly spaced at, at housekeeping genes. And so what we imagine is that when an RNA polymerase hits a nucleosome, you uh, create a hexamer, and then you set up a competition between hexamer repair and a second polymerase. So at a growth gene, the polymerases are coming through evenly, and you can repair the octamer before the second one comes. Whereas conversely, at a stress gene, what you find is because the polymerases come in clumps, you're much more likely to have a second polymerase hit the hexamer and knock it off. Okay? Um, so that ends our little side excursion here. Biologically, the point is replication independent turnover. Among other things, effectively, what you see two more different different dynamic process that mark coding regions and basically tell you our locations just described that tell you where nucleus if you want to about chromatin is something that's in because when something is transcribed and mess with the chromatin. So how do you find um, A related to that, uh, if we could face value the idea that you could take a stretch of naked and predict where all the based promoters, you could predict what the expression levels tell you what the modifications are, um, then what's the point of making a history for a piece of DNA? This is the inheritance question. If you do the experiment of taking a naked yeast genome and putting it into an S phase. What's going to be the difference between that chromatin and the chromatin you actually get from it has some history, it's seen the world, or its great-grandmother saw the world. Uh, and so this is really what we want to start to understand in terms of thinking about epigenetic heritage. What we'd like to measure are the following. Uh, as I mentioned, histones come off the day when the replication fork comes through, sort of out before they sit back down. If we paint nucleus Three let's go this phase. How big pink smear do we get after S phase? Uh, second, we want to know whether or not the nucleosome, the histones incorporated at forks is the same, okay? Early versus late is one way of thinking about it. And then and finally, how do old nucleosomes talk to new nucleosomes? What's the equation? So these are things we'd like to be able to measure. I think we have a shot at uh, this, one, this one. This is not really for us, this is for the bio. So basically, we use the same type of system I described for turnover. Um, we use a, actually an improvement that was developed by Ben Lev at the Netherlands Cancer Institute uh, and his name for Zeilbergen. Uh, and basically, the problem with this system we use is that gal driving H3 creates a bit of a problem because you pop out centromeres and you throw your everywhere. So when you actually go through replication, these strains are, are problematic. So we use is a native H3 promoter with histone H3 that has an HA tag C terminus. There are lock sites, so Cree locks recombination will, will pop out a circle around the lock sites. So when you induce Cree with beta estradiol, 
you pop off the HA tag and you leave a T7 tag. So now all the histones you synthesize from then on are going to be T7 tagged. Then what you can do is you can again track where HA tags are versus T7 tags after one, three, six generations. And that's in fact what we do. Uh, the only trick here, or one technical note, is that uh, about one to two percent of yeast don't carry out this recombination. So you have a background of roughly two percent of nucleosomes genome-wide that still have HA. And so your background noise is sort of rising relative to your signal over multiple divisions. So after six divisions, two percent of your histones are from great, 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 great grandmother, and uh, two percent are there for the nonchers. Okay? Just something to that limits how far we can go. Um, okay, so first we do this on microarray, and so this is a chromosome three view. Red means you're keeping old nucleosomes. Green means you're not. Um, yet again, the, my major prediction about this up front would be that epigenetically regulated loci, so subtelomeric gene expression and silent mating gene expression is epigenetically heritable. Uh, so I expected that those replication forks would take great pains to keep your old histones around. Uh, and that's not at all. You don't see red caps on the chromosomes. They're not particularly depleted, but they're simply not more enriched for old histones than similar loci. Uh, here what you see where the color is getting dimmer from three generations to six generations is what I described of your background signal coming up, okay? so. Uh, we were encouraged by looking at chromosome 3, so we now do this as a deep sequencing project. Uh, and so in the next slide, I'll show you what the deep sequencing data looks like. And we're going to, as we usually are, we're going to be gene-centric about this and just line up all 6,000 yeast genes. Oh, man, color is brutal here. Um, okay, well, what you would be able to see um, is that, so we carry out k-means clustering here, and yeast genes fall into end up this is k equals 5. Uh, yeah, that's tough. Okay, so the striking thing that you can see uh, is that for the majority of these clusters, uh, and I'll sort of point out, here's the transcriptional start site. You're moving into the gene in this direction. So this is your sort of promoter region, and this is your coding region. And what you find in a very striking manner is that you see a half block of red and a half block of green. You see the same thing here. You see it to a less extent here, and then these guys are green, okay? So for the vast majority of yeast genes, what you find is that this is three generation data. What you find is that your great grand maternal system proteins all end up piling up at the five prime ends of genes, okay? Uh, which is a bit of a surprise. The only place you don't see that, where you basically don't see any accumulation of great grand maternal histone proteins are at uh, genes with Go annotations such as translation, ribosomes, blah, 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 so very highly transcribed genes, okay? Now, now first of all, because the most striking aspect of this data is the five prime accumulation, um, I'll say why we think this is occurring, which is that um, the other thing about the in vitro biochemistry of RNA polymerase hitting a nucleosome is the model for how RNA polymerase gets through a nucleosome is that Here's the day on the histone octamer. I'm the octamer. RNA polymerase comes in, DNA comes the octamer a bit, pole 2 keeps moving in on the DNA. Now the DNA behind polymerase reassociates with the octamer, and this bubble with polymerase in it gets around the octamer out, and pole 2 gets out the other side. This will result in a net retrograde movement of the histone octamer. Okay, prediction pole 2 is passing nucleosomes back over time. Um, some of the data that supports that idea comes from uh, something we just published, which is that if you use in vivo a sensitive allele of the pole 2 subunit, polymerase, you find that you fall forward. Majority of genes. Okay, you see the, the from two uh, hours after killing RNA polymerase. With the idea operational, it's squeezing nucleosomes. Other instances, very highly transcribed genes show a genes and do poorly transcribed genes. Again, consistent over genes back. So, the point of uh, the reason for this sort of five-prime pileup of old stones 
sort of walking backwards over the gene over time. Now, uh, again, invisible to you, actually it's not quite as bad here. You line up all genes by the amount of old histone that they end up with at their five prime, from high levels of ancestral retention to poor levels of, of ancestral retention. What you find is, first of all, what I told you is that uh, genes don't maintain histone, they're highly transcribed genes. The other thing that you couldn't see on the last slide uh, the genes that retain lots of old histone tend to be longer genes, okay? And I think this is a very interesting observation because uh, I think it tells us that old histones stay relatively close to what they were before, okay? Um, so highly transcribed before do show some histone replacement over the coding region. So if we plot histone replacement, which is on the x-axis, ancestral retention, on the y axis, you see what you'd expect, which is that if you're throwing this away, you're not going to get any of grandma's nucleosomes. So hot nucleosomes don't retain well. But there's a fair bit of scatter here, okay, around the anti-correlation. And so if you take as your model that old histones come off, completely mix, and then reassociate with the daughter genomes, then effectively what you should see is that ancestral retention should be a perfect anti-correlate with turnover. And instead, what we see is a fair bit of width here. And much of this width comes from gene length, OK? So for a given level of turnover, you retain grandma's nucleosomes better if you're in a longer gene than if you're in a shorter gene. OK, and our model for why that occurs is that if you imagine that nucleosomes stay close to where they used to be with a little bit of fuzz, then if you're a cold nucleosome in the middle of two hots, at some frequency, you're going to fall off a cliff on either side. Whereas if you're a cold nucleosome in the middle of a domain of cold, you can sort of bounce around in that domain for a while and be retained. Okay, so we think that the sort of positive correlation between old histone retention and gene length tells us that old histones stay close, but not exactly where they used to be. Now, the other thing we've done is we've looked at, and here you guys can finally see this five prime pattern I showed you. What you're looking at is uh, HA over T7, old histones, plotted versus gene body. And so here's your peak around the plus three nucleosome, okay? Um, we've done this over time, okay, zero, one, three, and six generations. And so we wonder whether or not the, the way this changes over time can tell us something about how far old nucleosomes move, okay? And so uh, what we do, this is uh, a soft wiener in, in Nier's lab, near Friedman. Uh, we explicitly model three processes. One is histone replacement, which we've measured, as I told you at the beginning. The second is passback, so that's nucleosomes walking three prime to five prime over genes. And then finally, what for us is the holy grail in this study, uh, we attempt to figure out how far nucleosomes spread when replication comes through. Okay, so this we use data already, uh, already measured, and then these two we estimate on a gene by gene basis and globally for how far do nucleosomes spread out. Um, the model does a very good job of uh, capturing the data. Again, sort of difficult to see, but these look very similar to each other. Uh, and so, punch sort of the big for the end. Um, here's the likelihood of how nuclear are allowed to spread, and the peaks around 350 to So, I would think that we can, it's a little bit old histones, old nucleosomes, spread out in their direction or can spread uh, during the um, Of course, this has never been measured. They say this is we pitch something, except that in the from so, uh, if you look at the extent disruption it's roughly a KB around, around four. This is the uh, indication for does during replication. Um, there's times where we do well. We basically don't do well at the three prime ends of genes, and this is because we model each gene in isolation. We don't let nucleosomes go between genes. Um, all three components are needed for the model. So here's for long genes. Uh, the the model and data, of course, uh, very well overlap, as I mentioned. And if you break the model in various ways by not letting nucleosomes spread out, off, 
for turning off turnover, uh, the model breaks in fairly intuitive ways. Um, in terms of turning off replication, which is the most interesting one to me, um, what we find is that if you don't allow nucleosomes to spread out at all replication, then what you find is that over multiple generations, all the histones should be off the cliff at the five prime end. And what you find is actually a little bit of maintenance of the five prime gradient, uh, which to us is a little bit of analogous to potential. Active transport plus diffusion can give you a sampling rate. Uh, and we think sort of transcription related pass back to the company, and then spreading during replication is the diffusion here. Uh, and I think I'm probably out of time, so I'll simply point out that. And the saga TFT thing shows as it always does, and we started looking for mutants things like spreading or passback or whatever. Uh, the most striking mutant is if you lop off the H4 tail, you flatten this profile, so the H4 tail appears to be required for this passback. If you kill topoisomerase isomerase one, you get something fairly similar. Uh, and then finally, uh, we looked at chromatin assembly factor, which is a chaperone that runs with a replication fork. We had kind of hoped that by killing it, we'd see nucleosomes now spread out. Um, and instead, what you actually see is a signature that uh, in the model is diagnostic of turnover slowing down, replication independent turnover. And in fact, we've gone back to this gal driven flag system, and sure enough, these guys slow down turnover. Um, so uh, that's about it. Um, people who did the work, uh, the original turnover study was experimentally done by Mike. In my last was done by uh, Tommy Kaplan, a collaborator. Uh, the, the turn of this was developed by Fred uh, Then a chunk of analysis and a chunk of the analysis and by a wiener in By direct from a sector, um, she insists, and I'm wondering when of nucleus from telling around the motor, she wants us to be very different regulation. Well, first of all, mention is that that. It's at the plus moving back, back they're moving in a wood chipper. So it's really a ray for you to a base gene. Means. You didn't know, but later you didn't know. It, uh, so of course, there are big gradient places. I've been in 36 to the 3 prime, did correlation between motions and and, and uh, at the high level of ancestral uh, relative to the gene transcribed from the K36 had been so this is a mess with the replication pattern. They looked at it much in between men. Two questions with two, um, genes basically turn over um, this extent of the relative number from transcription from the test to the gene. So the point is orally essentially. Is there a Absolutely, but there is no number of uh, uh, the, the, the base here. So if I, I gave you a gene six level base, some sort of prediction for the relative amount. It, so it, it, it does give me a lot Histones and blue. Uh, 
and it also does depend on the description of the So it's that determine what not make the old history. Remarkable that you actually normalize everyone to the same. And there's a very this, but it looks like the first person in the old history is hanging out in the lab. Bit weird. Yeah. I mean, you for example, we're not, not surprisingly do for negative control. Did you think about, for example, experiment in this system? Mm. Yeah, so, so this is looking at, so we have. We scan or have interest in uh, so He did do miracle. The problem is, I would have said, deletes would have killed the fact that he more than his around the answer to delete. The is, we have to look at the answer to delete the other targets. This one at it was valuable the surface of acquire a modification in their heads. Yep. So, sort of defines the sin with which you can inherit from that to a direction. You're not going to inherit bases. Um, isn't the case that he that keep the regulated, the young they transcribe and the active main condition they on? So it's not, not the case of the place that are heritable. Um, that place is that our uh, don't, don't take the stone. Talking, right? I have a very nuclear remaining. My dad's yet a genetic information. Of course, can maintain it. Um, uh, it would have been that the muscles would be a little bit more than they are. Okay, thank you. Speaker.